All right, guys, so I'm going to talk you through um, this new unit, uh, parts of the new unit. So in order for us to really understand what torque is um, and how we're going to use it, we have to really understand what equilibrium is. And a lot of the stuff you're going to see with rotational motion is going to remind you of stuff we saw in circular motion, um, but we're going to have to cover some new talking points. Um, but, you know, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact me after the lecture. So let's just go ahead and get started. So equilibrium, how to achieve it, this will cover um, in this book that they're working from 9.1, 9.2. So we'll just cover two sections of work today. So what is equilibrium? We're really looking at balance. So I think of what a lot of people think when they say equilibrium, they think of a, a seesaw, which is very, very, very um useful and we're going to definitely use example problems using a seesaw um, but in this day all opposing internal forces and interactions are equal so you see the physical state of balance but you also see this internal force balance um, so the first condition of equilibrium is that the internal net force of the system has to be zero well we know that the that equilibrium we always think of the sum of the forces is equal to zero um, so they all balance out so if you look at this car down here at the bottom, you have the weight acting downwards. You have four points of contact on the ground where a normal force would act. So all of these added together is going to equal that weight, correct? Okay, because you have this free body diagram right over here. Weight acting downwards, these four will equal that weight. Then you have, as it's moving, you have an applied force that way. But you also have friction acting back against the tires, which would make the net force equal to zero. This is where free body diagrams become very, very useful. Um, it lets you visualize what you're saying um, as far as things that are acting on an object. So it is important for you to, you know, be able to recognize um, all the forces that are acting. So something that, you know, a lot of people think equilibrium means sitting still. That's far from the truth. That is part of it. But you can also travel with a constant velocity and, ha and be in equilibrium um, because that means there is no force, right? There is no acceleration, thus there is no force. If you look at the FEMA equation, if there's no acceleration, that means there's no, there's, the sum of the forces is equal to zero, which means that it can be moving at a constant velocity, okay? And the real key point there is that there is no acceleration. So static equilibrium exists when there's no motion. Dynamic equilibrium is what we call that. That exists when there's constant motion. Okay, now if we change direction, obviously that means it had to accelerate. Thus, we're not in equilibrium anymore. This is moving in a straight line in one direction. So do all instances of the sum of forces equal zero result in equilibrium? So if you look at this, um, we see that there's two type of forces that are acting against um, in this diagram, there are two forces that are acting um, opposite. So the sum of the forces would equal zero in this case. So non-equilibrium rotation accelerates, okay? So if you look at those were acting, let's look at this diagram. These forces are acting at the same point, okay? They're equal, but they're acting at the same point. So yeah, it's gonna equal zero, right? It's gonna remain stationary. But you go to the non-equilibrium, they're the same forces. So the free body diagram looks the exact same, but they're acting at two different points. What is going to happen to this object? It's going to rotate, and that's what gets us into torque. So the second condition of equilibrium. In equilibrium, an object will not have angular acceleration. Okay, So we've talked about linear acceleration this whole time. Um, with the FEMA equation. Now we have to talk about angular acceleration, which brings in a whole different talking point, which is torque. Okay, so that's the rotational equivalent of force. That is that is really the best way that you can remember it. It is the rotational equivalent of force. So now instead of just talking about force equals mass times acceleration, we're talking about torque equals mass times angular acceleration. Okay. Um, here's your uh, fancy little T that is torque. Okay, that's ta, um, which is just you know a representation of torque because you can't use T because that's time period or time um, is equal to R F sine of theta, and we will talk a little bit about why this is the way it is 
um, moving forward. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay, R is the distance from the pivot point. Okay, so that is a distance. So there's two things that this should kind of remind you of. Number one, um, if you think about force times distance, you think of work. Torque is force, but it's got to be in a perpendicular fashion to a point. Okay, so this is the R is the distance from the pivot point. So how far, how far right here is the force being acted from that pivot point? Okay, it's going to rotate around that pivot point A. Okay, so we have to look at how far away is that force being added. But in order for us to get a good idea as far as what the torque is, we have to look at it in a perpendicular fashion. So that's why your sine of theta comes in. We got to look at the, the opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. We got to look at this value um, that is the um, perpendicular orientation to that pivot point. Force, obviously, is whatever applied force that we have. Um, it can also be weight that is added on one side, and that's your force. Um, we'll probably see an example of that here soon. Um, and then sine of theta, angle between the applied force and the direct or the direction of the pivot. I was like, what's direct? The direction of the pivot. Okay, so sine of theta, um, we're looking at the applied force and the direction of the pivot. Okay, we're applying it straight in this line. Pivot points here, but we've got to look at this distance between, which is R perpendicular, um, and that's what gives us that value. So here's your practice problem. Uh, what is the torque experienced by an open if it is opened at a 90 degree angle, 0.8 meters from the hinges with 40 newtons of force? Okay, so that is a plug and chug type of question. Um, I'm giving you time to think about it. Everybody knows that sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. O1, 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 U1, 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 Okay. Um, so then now you just multiply 0 0.8 with 40 newtons of force. Um, and you should get the answer to be around, this is me taking a guess because I don't have a piece of paper here on me. Um, it'd be around 30 something, 36, anywhere from 32 to 36, probably. Um, I think it's 32, actually. When I, when I said that, I think I realized it's about 32. Okay, so let's just plug in that, those values in. Okay, so I'm going to give you a chance to read through this. The two children shown are balanced on the seesaw of negligible mass. The first child has a mass of 26 kilograms and sits 1.6 meters from the pivot, okay? So it's giving you that distance. If the second child has a mass of 32 kilograms, how far is she from the pivot in order to balance that out? And then what is the um, FP, the supporting force exerted by the pivot? So I'm gonna give you a chance to solve that, and I'm gonna need to get a piece of paper while you solve it. Okay, so the first thing you should do um, when you're solving part A, you got to know what the torque is of the, f the first child. So you have a mass of 26.0 kilograms. That is the mass. You have a distance of 1.6 meters. That's your distance. That's your R. Okay, and you have the equation torque is equal to R times F sine of uh, theta. Well, your theta here is what? It's acting straight downwards, so your theta is 90 degrees, 
Okay, it's already perpendicular, so that's going to be 1. Okay, so what's your force in this case? The only force acting downwards would be the weight of the object. So to solve for weight, you got to do 26.0 kilograms times gravity. For simple math purposes, I'm just going to use 10. But if you want to go ahead and solve with 9.8, that, that's perfectly fine too. Okay, so you solve. That's going to be 260 newtons, somewhere thereabouts. That's going to be your force that's added in. Okay, so what's your distance? Your distance is given to be 1.60 meters. That'll find your torque. Okay, so we got to balance these torques. We have to have the sum of the forces are equal to zero. Okay, so they have to balance each other. And then them together on part B have to balance with that supporting force because due to the pivot. So first, let's balance out the two children. So we have the weight acting downwards. We have that torque. Should be 260 times 1.6. That is, I'm having to do the math. Is it about 182? Um, I did that math really quick, but that should be about. Should not be about all right. Oh, this should be around three, three or four. Yeah, four, four sixteen. I think that's closer to right. Okay, so four sixteen. Should be about your answer. Um, so that is your torque of the first child. So now we want to find the torque of the second child. That's got to be a balance of that. So you can go ahead and put 416 in. And then R. And that's what we're, we're wanting to solve for. We're wanting to know the R. We're wanting to know how far from the pivot point they are. So then you do force. Well, what's the force in this case? The force is going to be equal to 32 times 10 to find the weight. So that's 320. Okay. And then that's still acting downward. So the sine of theta is going to be equal to 1. All right. So do your division. Divide 320 from both sides. So 416 divided by 320. Number one, do you know if, if they're a greater weight, are they going to be closer or further away from the pivot point? They're going to be closer, okay? So you can know automatically that it's going to be closer than 1.6 meters, okay? A heavier object has to be closer. How do you, this is where a lot of people think about, they think about the leverage point, okay? So you got to know how much leverage you need. When you're jacking up a car, you obviously weigh less than the car. So you got to have a longer lever arm to get more leverage. Okay, that's all that torque is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so you can solve how far they are away by doing that division that I'm not going to do because I don't have a calculator next to me. And then what is the pivot uh, supporting force? It would just be their two weights added together. Um, so 320 plus 260, so that's going to be 580. Okay, so that's going to be the supporting force. So, quick summary. Statics is the study of force and equilibrium. Two conditions must be met to achieve equilibrium, uh, which is either to find my motion with or without, or without linear or rotational acceleration. Linear would be force equal zero. Rotation would be torque is equal to zero. So the first condition necessary to achieve equilibrium is that the net external force of the system must be equal to zero. And then the second condition is also known that the torques are balanced. Um, and that looks at this distance times force times the sine of theta. The perpendicular lever arm, R with that upside down T, is the shortest distance from the pivot point to the line along which F acts. SI unit is newton meter. Okay, the second uh, condition necessary to achieve equilibrium is that net external torque on a system must be zero. So by convention, counterclockwise torques are positive. So if we're moving a counterclockwise, that is a positive torque. Clockwise torques are negative. I think that that is it. So I'm going to be posting some example problems for you to do um, that will be helpful for you moving forward.
Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. Um, just keep an eye out on Google Classroom and I'll have stuff posted. Thanks, guys.